Hi, this is Dr. Pulsifer to take my courage in my hands and discuss seven fundamental questions of games design. Now, I've got to be nuts to try to do this, but nonetheless, I'm going to try to, to discuss these seven questions which every designer has to answer, although many, if not most, designers are not really aware that they're answering the questions. What they do is make assumptions that this is the way it is, and that's what they do, rather than recognizing that there's more than one way to do something. These questions are more fundamental than schools of design. They're even more fundamental than a question like, who is your audience? This is about what kind of game you want to make. And these are spectrums of choice. They're not either or. They're not digital. They're analog. There's a uh, whole range of possible answers. And most designers fall somewhere in between in any particular case. And within the same game, they can go one way and the other way. And of course, sometimes that doesn't turn out so well. So we can name games that go to one extreme or the other in certain categories and others that tend to fall in between. So I'm going to list the questions here and then I'll discuss each one. The first one, and these are not in any particular order, but I think this is the most important question in games. Is there active human opposition or a good semblance, or is there not? Now keep in mind I'm talking about brainware, not athleticware. It's fairly easy to make a computer opponent that plays outstandingly well in athleticware because computers are so fast and accurate. And what you're doing in athleticware is hand-eye coordination, quick movement, that sort of thing, which the computer can do better than any human. I'm talking about brainware where you're using your brain primarily and not your athletic skills or physical skills. So programmed opposition in brainware will normally be much less than human. Really good computer programmed opponents can begin to approach the level of an average to weak human player. But keep in mind when people play a game, even a game that's partly athleticware, to play the single player version and go online, they find out that human opponents are much better than the game was. Now, I should make a caveat there. Sometimes, especially in athletic wear, the designers and developers of the game deliberately make the computer opponent less capable than it could be because if it's too good, players will assume it's cheating and they won't like it. The next question, are you making a model or an abstract game? Now every game is an abstraction because we're simplifying reality. It could be a fictional reality, but still there's a reality there, even when we model something. But models have something that abstract games don't. That's correspondence. What you do is analogous or corresponds to something in reality. And what happens in the game has that same character. Abstract games generally don't have that, or at least not consistently. And of course, there are games that are partly abstract and partly model, and every model is partly abstract because games are abstractions. Is there an always correct solution to your game? Which is to say, is it a puzzle? Non-puzzles often have no always correct play, though there may be a mixed strategy. Most single-player games are really puzzles. And I want you to look at the diagram there, the formal puzzle, the no solution game, and puzzle games in between. When a puzzle is solved, the game wears out. When somebody says, I beat the game, they mean they've solved the puzzle. When somebody does a speed run, they can go really fast because they've solved the puzzle. Now, some board games have multiple paths to victory, multiple always correct solutions in effect, and this enables them to be parallel competition or multiplayer solitaire because there are several ways that players can go. Perhaps that's also a reason why so many of this kind of game are played just one to three times long enough to figure out the solutions, and then players move on to something else. Next question, are you focusing 
on interesting decisions or on wish fulfillment. This is also posed as rules emergent games versus progressive games. Wish fulfillment happens mostly in video games, though it can happen in tabletop RPGs as well. And experience is somewhere in between, although leaning toward the wish fulfillment. I wish I was a great hero who could fly. Well, that can be part of an experience in a video game. Are you designing a game or writing a story? And in many ways, that's related to the previous question. Most games aren't actually about stories, but not everyone understands that. Stories require strong control of player actions from the author designer. Games do not. Think of the director of a movie, or the author of a novel, or author of a play. They control completely what happens. And that enables them to make better stories in most respects than a game can possibly do. Is it consequence-based or reward-based? In consequence-based games, which are the traditional games, you can fail, you can lose. There can be negative consequences. In reward-based games, persistence leads to success. You can't lose, you can't fail, you can't suffer negative results in the long run, and you're constantly rewarded. This is common in free-to-play games and MMOs to keep people playing. It's more like a movie or a novel or a play insofar as the player can be pretty passive and may allow the game to guide him or her. Do you want to closely control what the players do or give them a lot of freedom of action? And this is posed in video games as open world versus linear or closed world. Are you letting the players write the story? Or are you guiding them through your story? And this is related, obviously, to the game as fiction versus game as game. Now, those are the seven questions. There are next level questions that are not fundamental in the same way, so I didn't include them above. And the two obvious ones is, who is your audience? And what is the player going to do? But by the time you approach those questions, you've already answered the first seven, most likely. What are not fundamental questions? Notice that electronic, non-electronic, or video tabletop, or digital analog, if you want to use that wrong-handed usage, is not a fundamental dichotomy. There's also no mention of innovation, because it's highly overrated and rarely exists. Math people story is important, but not fundamental. Answering the first seven questions goes a long way to answering the question of all games are math, games are about people, or games are about stories. Food for thought. Some people don't like to think about what they're doing, they just like to do. But the people who like to think about what they're doing should take this to heart. Thanks for listening.